Good morning, folks. We've got a number of stories to hit today, including on a Centaur asteroid, Jupiter, and a lot of Nova news at the end. We're starting, as always, over at spaceweathernews.com, and we find the last 24 hours on our star without titanic eruptions, but we did have considerable coronal pops and expansion shocks as the sunspot group on the south grew incredibly over the last 36 hours. What began as a small but spreading active region developed dozens of spots before separating to stability just as another group of umbra was born to its north, actually a second sunspot group in the region, and they're departing our view. Solar wind has been calming. Top left, the purple plasma speed marks are on a three-day descent, and on the bottom, green prevails on the KP index as the magnetic field gains calm as well. We'll start out with a quick jab to the people who demand we give up our freedoms, economy, and let them spray the sky, but who have more uncertainty in their models than trying to pick the Super Bowl champion today. Not as flashy, but way more embarrassing, is a potential weak equivalence principle violation by tiny particles in space phenomena. A very cool idea, until you realize what it means for the rest of science built upon the previous concept. Folks, we've got a Centaur asteroid activating in the solar system, turning into a comet with a 400,000 kilometer coma just out past Saturn. The Centaurs in our system are all between Jupiter and Neptune. Up next, We've got a serious challenge in a serious journal. Jupiter's constant auroral curtain cannot be explained simply with the rotation of the magnetic system. It is almost as though there must be a permanent connection to the sun through the interplanetary magnetic fields or something. If going back to 1990 science is too difficult for the few dozen NASA folks watching this morning, why not start with your recent press release on the sprites and elves at Jupiter? Consider what we know about their role in Earth's global electric circuit and ask what that must look like on Jupiter. Up next, let's discuss small nova events. The smallest of all in terms of ejecta is the type 1 x-ray burst from pulsars. While the x-rays could cook any nearby planet, the ejected shell wouldn't even hit Mercury if it happened on the Sun. One step up from that is the dwarf nova. Some believe they actually happen in the accreted material disk, but either way, these are indeed what their name suggests, dwarf nova. Today we report on the most anomalous dwarf nova ever, with pre-eruption light anomalies that further expand the story of what stars do under duress. And now that we've hit the tiniest nova events, and since we don't want to charge all the way up to supernova destruction of the star, let's go to the middle, recurrent nova and classical nova. Gorgeous shots showing ejecta at a distance that pretty much matches the outer Oort cloud range in our system. Just like the smaller nova events, these recurrent and classical nova do not destroy the star, but instead blast off the material accumulated in their atmospheres, leaving the star behind like a snake having newly shed its skin. Sadly, there are three among the dozens of lines of evidence in Earth's catastrophe cycle that demand a long period recurrent solar micronova. We cannot explain all the evidence without it. Pre-order of our book on the rebirth of catastrophism will be next month. We greatly appreciate your support. We've got wind maps and shots of our star to close. And of course, we'll do this all again tomorrow. Right here, but right now, it's 5.30 a.m. in the new Valley of the Sun. Eyes open. No fear. Be safe, everyone.